Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, July 15th, 2003, uh, approximately 2.45 p.m. Uh, the interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Frederick G. Mankin. I was born on August 15th, 1924, in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, what was your educational background prior to military service? High school. Okay, um, where were you and what was your, what were your feelings when you heard about Pearl Harbor? What had happened at Pearl Harbor? Anger and shock and disbelief. Where were you at the time? In Brooklyn, we had finished the stickball game on Sunday and we were heading for the Electra Theater in Bay Ridge to see a movie. Mm -hmm. That was a Sunday afternoon thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got into the theater, I, of course, people coming in already heard, but those who were already there did not. And they flashed that on the screen, they put up a file card on the screen, and uh, th there was a gasp from the audience. And uh, the next day I understand that all the recruiting places were swamped. Mm -hmm. I went on uh, December 16th with my very best friend who was uh, 17 on that day. I was 17 the previous August. And uh, we went to the Navy and they had a program at that time which had not changed from 17 to 21. So his father was there to sign him in and I, they said, where's your father? I said, well he told me Mr. Thorson could sign me in. He said, get out of here. Go get your own father. I went home and I asked my mother. And she said, no way. And mother's, you know, but I had the idea that somehow Hank and I would be together forever. Mm -hmm. Instead of just playing stickball and smooth of the girls, we were, we were going to be in the Navy together. He went on to become a career man and he uh, made the chief petty officer and a very illustrious career and a lot of uh, decorations and uh, became a school teacher in San Diego the minute he was discharged as a chief warrant officer. Mm -hmm. And I've lost touch with him but uh, we did have a couple of wonderful visits. And uh, he had a good career and I admire every bit of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I noticed you went into service in uh, February of 43. Um, were you drafted or were you... I was you drafted. I, I, I went to... I had a job that I made up about eighteen dollars a week as an office boy, and that was important to my mom. And uh, the depression is something I never wish on any American, because it cannot understand the the horror and the the distress that it brings to people. It's not just simply a, a recession. Mm -hmm. A man with skills and, and will and strength can't make five dollars a day, and that's what I remember. So, and I said to mom, I'm 18 now, you can't stop me in August of 42. She said, please hang out there till Christmas. So, I um, think I'm a good son, and uh, I did that. And then I went to the Navy at Grand Central Palace, uh, uh, Broad, excuse me, Broad Street, early in uh, January. And I got to the end of the line, and I passed everything, flying colors, uh, with the except of one minor medical problem, which was uh, a question of personal hygiene, which was taken care of by a rabbi. And uh, in any event, the delay uh, put me to the letter from the, the Navy. I went back. I said, here I am already. They said, you did that in a week? You know. I said, yeah. He said, you're a gung-ho kid. We want you. I says, okay, sign me up. He said, be careful. You, know, you, you got to heal. And I said, well, uh, if you take me today, am I going to be in Newport tomorrow? And he says, no. Ten days and two weeks. I said, sign me up. And I went home waiting for letters to come. I still have a letter that says, if you want to get into the CBs, come right on down here. And if you don't want to get in the CBs, which I didn't, uh, wait for the next letter. At the end of January 1943, there was a picture in the paper with a bunch of men holding their hands up being sworn in, and it said the first draftees in the history of the United States Navy. So I ran back to Broad Street, I said, what's this? He said, President Roosevelt signed the law, and all the manpower comes to the draft pool. Well, what about me? He said, kid, you're one of 400 in this office in the same boat. 
Broad Street. What do I do? Go to your draft board. Tell them to draft you. You're gung ho. So I did. And of course, they, when they send a bunch of people in the draft, they send them with a monitor with all the, the paperwork, and they go on the subway at 7 in the morning. My draft board opened up at 9.30, and by the time I got the papers, I got the Grand Central Palace, it was, oh, 12, 31 o'clock, and I'm running around there in the nude with a pack of papers trying to catch up, and I get to the end of the line, and the Navy chief is locking up his desk, and I say, chief, wait, one more, and he says, no, can't do, I got my quota for the day. So what am I supposed to do? I'll come back tomorrow. He says, you can't come back tomorrow, you're being drafted. So I didn't know what to do, and I saw they swore it. The Marines made a wonderful pitch, but I told them I heard about Guadalcanal, no thanks. And uh, consequently, I was sworn into the Army on December, uh, February 8th, 1943. And I went on active duty the following Monday. They gave me two paper tickets, said, this you belong to us now, this will get you on a subway to go home, this will get you on a subway to come back to Penn Station next week. That's the way it worked. Where did you go for your training? Uh, I mean, initial training was uh, uh, Tent City, St. Petersburg, Florida, which was open a couple of weeks before we got there. It was closed a couple of weeks after I left because of sanitary problems. But uh, what I did note, in marching around the first week of processing in St. Pete, all marching and singing sixpence and caissons and all that, the people didn't seem to appreciate us. And it wasn't until I got old that I recognized the fact that we were a bunch of young kids shoved down their throats in, in St. Petersburg. But they, they got us out of town after the week and they sent us out to Tent City, which was brutal. And uh, we went, made it through there and I was assigned to get on a train and go to Santa Anita, California, where I went to an ordinance training school, one of two in the country, Aberdeen being the one on the East Coast. And, uh, said they need a racetrack converted to a training school. And there I learned about the California lifestyle and the, the wonderful people and everybody was from California was from someplace else. That was great. And in spite of the gas shortage, I will say, uh, if 50 guys walked out that front gate to go to, sh to, go to town, nobody would pass with a car without loading up. That's the way people were. That's the kind of memories I have <laughs> of what this country was. Training, training completed, uh, transferred to the Repel Depot in uh, Salt Lake City for assignment, signed to a transitional bomb group in El Paso, where they put 10 members from different schools together and say, you are crew, shake hands, there's your bomb and learn to fly it. And, uh, and after a period of time, there was a call for volunteers. Uh, the, 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 the hook was, if you volunteer to get on this ship that's going to India, it's in quarantine in Staten Island, we'll give you a day in New York, uh, a week in New York. So naturally, all the guys bailed on and got on that train. And the train got as far as Colorado, someplace in the middle of the night, they said, okay, everybody off. And we sat in the desert for an hour or two, you know, looking at the stars. It was really in, in the boonies. And uh, we saw headlights coming, and we got on board, and they took us to Lowry Field, which is Army Air Force Base. And as you get some sleep, we'll, we'll work you over in the morning. And I was part of the first section to join the group. I looked, That's hearsay. Whatever I tell you is what I heard and believed. So, we were part of the first complete section to join the group after Cadbury. Cadbury had been moving around the country for a month or two. Had come from Alamogordo and was in Denver. And then we started to get more manpower for four squadrons at headquarters. And the plane started to come in. We started to learn what to, how to do our job. And we did that through the summer of 43. I was uh, in my squadron when I was 18. My 19th, 20th, 21st birthdays were still in that squadron. They kicked me loose about a month and a half after my 21st birthday, which was the day the Japanese surrendered. I got a discharge and I began a new life. Mm -hmm. 
I learned a lot of things about good people from all over. We used to tease each other, you know, tell the guy from Kansas about how do we catch piss clams. They don't believe it. <laughs> and then the guy from Ogazox, we said, what are you crabbing about? You never owned shoes before. But they said the same thing about New Yorkers, too. <laughs> uh, now, you went to the European theater? Yes. We, uh, we, my furlough, pre embarkation furlough, was 10 days to get from Denver to New York and back to Denver. And the rattler that stopped at every cow. And I, I ended up spending an extra four days so I could be with my family. Mm -hmm. And I went back for I trust the I trust the guards. And they said, Do you want a court martial? Do you want company punishment? I said, I'll take company punishment. So they gave me two weeks of nine KP in addition to my daily job. So that was a good deal for four. Uh -huh. And I told them the same story. They said, Everybody says the, the travelers age screwed up in Chicago, right? I said, Yeah, that's what happened. It was a regular routine. They know how to do it. But the chaplain was a great guy. and He, he arranged for me to have travel money. And, uh, it's just, I spent my time with my family. I kissed them all goodbye. Went back to Denver. And uh, we shipped out in October. And we came to New York uh, via the Susquehanna Valley. I'll never forget that ride. Uh, we crossed over in the Buffalo and came down the back of New York to Port Jervis, not not the New York Central route. Mm -hmm. And I never saw such a beautiful country in my life because as a kid, I had never been any farther south in Coney Island or any farther east in uh, western Weehawken. Mm -hmm. And I saw my country on those train rides through 36 states through uh, first class steam mm -hmm. when steam was king. And I was a rail buff, and I knew how to hear whistle talk, and I knew what, how to clock the speed of the train, and I was rapping with the, hanging out the Dutch door of the Pullman at all times, looking at the world. The other guys were reading comic books and playing blackjack, sleeping. I was looking at America, and I wondered often if it wasn't part of a government policy to get some kid like myself who might die to have, get a look at the country he's going to die for. If it wasn't, it wasn't a policy, it should have been, because it was very, very important. I saw the mountains and the prairies and, and just what a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. Now, you were, were you assigned to the 8th Air Force then? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. sort of, well, we, when I came home on my 19th birthday, I told my grandpa, who was uh, German heritage, he had bailed out of Hanover in 1890 because of the possibility of cannon fodder in the Prussian War. And came to Maine as an immigrant. And my grandmother came to Maine as a f head of a family of five with six children. Mm -hmm. She was a, is 15 years old. She's the head of the family. The parents were lost with diphtheria in, in Glasgow. So they came to Maine where an elder sister res resided. And they have Philip met Charlotte. And my mother was born in 1905, and I have both of those people on the census, which was put on microfilm in Washington uh, at 1900. Mm -hmm. And I, these are beautiful documents because they're all written in beautiful script, and they all tell the background of the people, their addresses in Lewiston, Maine. They all worked in the Bates Mills. Bates, Bates, President Drapes were very big at one mm -hmm. time. And that's where they settled down. But I said to him, we're going to I'm in a bomber squadron, and we're either going to Europe or the Pacific, Grandpa. He said, what are you telling me? I was very proud of him. I said, well, it's your homeland, you know. And he says, nonsense. This is my homeland. I became a citizen in 1901. And uh, if the German people let Hitler get on top, they deserve anything he'd get. You made no excuses to me. And that was really something to hear. And uh, he would never let us speak German in the house. My daughter works and lives in Munich. She's married there. She makes a lot of money speaking five languages, or about five. Mm -hmm. She's and she's made her life over there with a guy who uh, whose father and I was supposed to kill each other at one time. 
and he's the best guy I ever met. He died a few years later, but she's been there since 86. And I've been there five times as her guest. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's a wonderful, beautiful lifestyle. Civilized, without the Nazis. Anyway, we, went into, we moved overseas on the Queen Mary, which was a big kick for me. And uh, we left on October 28th and got there in Gurukh in Scotland and Clyde Estuary on November 2nd. And uh, when the Queen Mary came into New York in a maiden voyage in 36, in the Normandy the previous year, I lived in Bay Ridge, which is the, the shoulder of, on the harbor. And I became an ocean liner freak. And uh, I watched those ships transition through the war when they all became gray. And the Normandy, of course, never made it. She burned at the dark. But, but uh, the Queen Mary would come and go, and I would see her down there. And I would look off from the top of Bliss Park and see more ships than you could count in the harbor. And the next day you go there, and they were gone. They went out through the submarine boom where the Verrazano Bridge is now, mm -hmm. and went out on their way. The Queen Mary, when it came time, she just went out by herself. And as dusk fell, we came through the boom, and all the guys on the boom tender were yelling, Hey, don't worry, guys. We'll take care of the girls for you. <laughs> Have a good time. And uh, last I saw the light on the end of 69th Street Pier, the ferry pier, is where I used to hang out. Lincoln Light. That was the last look I got at Brooklyn. And we got over there and put on a train, uh, rolled down through the blackout, <coughs> and uh, got up in the morning and looked out at beautiful England. There's no way to describe it. I felt that I was reading Charles Dickens and seeing it with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. It's such, such a glorious, beautiful place and provincial, too. Mm -hmm. So I had a wonderful time with 21 months in England. I met beautiful people. I had a, I chatted up a young, chatted up a bird, they used to say, uh, in a tea room. I asked her to go to movies. She said, sure, young, you know, meet you at the Haymarket. And I wanted to walk her home in a blackout. And she said, this is as far as you go. Why? I want to take you to your door. She said, no, no. How about next week? We've got the movies, all right. Next week, I said, if I don't take you to the door, I'm not seeing you again. So she says, okay, next time you can pick me up at the house. And the reason for this was that she says, I brought a yank home two weeks ago, and they didn't like him, and I didn't want to do it again. But Mr. and Mrs. Fred Adams, Fred was a, a veteran of the Gallipoli campaign. He spent a year in uh, Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he was a great man, a wonderful guy. His two sons, one was in Italy and one was in Burma. Joyce was uh, my date. I got 9 KP in the officer's mess and I swiped a ham and some shell eggs and I gave them Easter dinner and I brought a can of succotash. That was a big faux pas. I went, so where's the succotash? They said, oh Fred, that's, we don't eat that. I said, why? Lied with beans and corn. I said, oh no, it's mice, it's for the hogs, you know. <laughs> so I, I went to the kitchen and I opened the can and put it on the sauce. So come on, we got to have this. They're having this ham. Queenie, the, I never know her first name, Queenie Adams, was standing for hours in a queue with a ration card to get a shank of a rabbit. I bring this ham in there. They went bonkers. And it was a, it was a great pleasure, you know, because the officers could afford it. They throw away a lot of stuff. Anyway, uh, they, uh, I, I saw them looking at me eating succotash like I was eating doggy do, and I somehow decided I was the wrong. I was the wrong thing to do. And in the course of it, dinner, Mom said, uh, she, "Joyce looks older than her age." I, I said, "Yeah, how old is she?" She said, "She just turned 16." So the, the girl turns to her mother and says, "Oh, Mom." Now you've done it. <laughs> so I said, well, now from now on, you're my kid's sister. And uh, I watch out for you. 
and uh, I did, and they became fast friends. And my family, my sister who is polio, sent me 25 five-pound boxes for the Christmas of 44. I don't know how she did it, but none of the boxes were broken. My dad sent me two bottles of steiny bottles of Schaefer beer with a package of pretzels in it. It's a five-pound box. Uh, five boxes came for the Adams family. I told mom, you know how big you are, queen is your size. Get her some nightgowns and things. And all this food, uh, this this clothing came from New York. And we go to the pub, and Fred was show off his tie because it said inside, Lord and Taylor, New York, mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue, New York. So it was, the pub scene was beautiful because it's out of town on the edge and everybody's very polite. Mm -hmm. And it's a social thing that, you know, you, British beer isn't that great, but you have a nice time and you throw darts and you behave like a American gentleman should. Mm -hmm. So that's my experience with the British people I wish I'd never lost touch with them, but I still have photographs of them, and uh, I hope they fared well, and I hope that Joyce fared well, whatever. Okay, so um, what kind of plane were you assigned to? Liberator, B-24s. Yeah. Okay. I was a ground crew, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, our job was to service them and do a particular job. In my case, our section did loading and fusing of bombs. And they uh, took care of uh, supplies of belted ammunition and uh, flares for signaling planes to other planes. The, when a lead plane went up, the color of the day might have been double green and yellow. So they had to have a hundred of those flares for the lead plane could shoot them off one as fast as he could do it. So that the planes coming up would not tag on to the wrong group. Mm -hmm. Another group was shooting triple greens or something like that. And those flares had to be there, and they had a shotgun in the, in the roof. And they pull it out, reach, shut the thing in, pull the trigger, open it up, fall down. And they just kept doing that until mm -hmm. the, the group was formed and on the way out. And it was a precision thing. And there were some mid-airs, but I'm telling you, what I like to tell people is the professionalism of the 8th Air Force, all young men, who did the impossible and uh, brought Hitler to his knees. Mm -hmm. Recently I went for a CAT scan and our illustrious fearless leader, chief executive, commander in chief, whatever, he's making a speech in Dill, McDill Field to a bunch of people and it's a photo op op. And every time he mentioned the dog catcher or the, con the councilman, he got a big cheer. Is somebody coming in? Um, okay, so you were. Uh, I would like to continue that. Sure. Um, continue. It, the camera's still going. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I looked at this. I'm sitting in the CAT scan all of a sudden. I said, "Folks, get ready for your daily dose of salts." And some guy turned around on me and he said. Uh, what are you? A wine? Were you in the military? So I guess he think I looked younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, yeah, I was in. He said, what were you in? I said, the 8th Air Force. You ever hear of it? No, the 8th Air Force like that. He brushes it off. I said, well, what you would do? He said, I was in the infantry. Is that something you chose? He says, you're damn right. This is an old fuck. And uh, and he said, you're damn right. I said, well, you're the only one I know that got that choice of assignment, no matter how we begged. It was just a crapshoot. And if you pick the infantry, you must have rocks in your head. So his wife kept telling him to shut up, not to start a fight. And when I got out, I went over to him and I said, are uh, well, you a cop? No. He said, well, you act like a cop. And, uh, and you, you know, I was, in the, I was in the Air Force. So when you got to Germany, did you see those cities? down to the curbside. He said, yeah. I said, you think they did it with guys with M1 Garands? That was done by strategic bombing. That's what brought him down. And the impossibility of keeping his troops supplied and keeping things moving. That was strategic bombing. And there were 
Three divisions of the 8th Air Force, approximately 3,000 aircraft. Two divisions were flying fortresses. One division was liberators. There's 14 modern groups all around the city of Norwich, like the hub of wheels. And uh, 14 groups and 72 aircraft apiece. That's a heavy, heavy hit. And I was with that from the time it was formed till it was deactivated. So, it was a wonderful time in my life, a horrible time, but it gives me so much to reflect on. Do you belong to the 8th <coughs> Air Force Historical Society? Yes, I'm the, uh, that, plus the 2nd Air Division Association, plus Beach Bell Echo, the 446 Bomb Group Newsletter, plus the Downstate Chapter of the New York, uh, we had 300 members, mm -hmm. a B-17 uh, Radio guy got it started in 1990, and we've been going pretty good since, although he has since moved on to go to California. And uh, we had four meetings a year, the biggest one is usually in West Point in October. And uh, all B-17 guys uh, make reference to B-24s as being ugly aircraft. That's a, that's a thing, you know, <laughs> the, the B-24 is the box the B-17 came in. But they're entitled to that belief because the no question the B-17 was a much better flying platform when you're in do in doo doo. Well, I'm sure it was all in, in good natured ribbing. Right? Oh yeah, <laughs> you know some guys, some guys. Uh, I used to, I would wear a show off shirt when I go at the meets we have here at Farmingdale, the Collins Foundation. If you're familiar with them, they have a B-17 and a B-24. They fly around America all year, and they've been coming to Farmingdale for 11 or 12 years now, on Labor Day. And I helped the guy move, I helped the boss move all this paraphernalia for our meetings and stuff. And he referred to me twice as Cooley Labor because I was a loaded bombs. And he said to me one day, and walking right behind me, he's a nice guy, you know, he's, he's staff sergeant or something. And he finished his tour, which is to his credit. But uh, he said, well, you got that show off shirt for all you will. You're just coolie labor. You know, I'm, I'm meeting shirts mm -hmm. with the squadron patch and the embroidery and my name and all that. And uh, he said, you're only coolie labor. And I turned around and I stopped it all. his nose to nose. I said, if you say that to me again, I'm going to give you a good look at the ceiling. Don't do it. And he never did. <laughs> It's about me what you want, but does Cooley Labor? We did a job, a hard job. Now let me ask you something. How did you get those bombs up into the the aircraft? Did you use like a forklift or something? Well, uh, no. The the B twenty four is very low to the ground, mm -hmm. so when the when it, the doors are roll up doors on the side, you have to duck to get under the door, even at maximum. And uh, the the catwalk is just about waist high, and you step up on that. And there are five stations on each rack, and there are four racks, two forward, two rear. And the bomb may is in that front mm -hmm. rear configuration. Uh, the first night we went to load, December 16, 43, we went out about 10 o'clock, and we got finished about 4 in the morning. And it was just a debacle. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And it took us so long. We threw the rule book away and we decided to do it practical. And there was a time when we could leave the barracks, go out and load up. A uh, standard load was 10 500s or possibly 12 if there was a short run. And uh, we would get back after chow, leave the planes, lock up the planes and leave before the crews got there, before the, sometimes the mechanics came even to warm them up. And we'd be back in the sack. And it would take us, uh, we'd get out there Midnight, come back at 2 o'clock. Boom, boom, boom. And it was done with uh, 500 pounders and up. was done with winches. Oh, I see. I see. And uh, bef lower than that, it was done did with muscle. Did the planes have winches in themselves? Or no, it was you... a winch you carried around. Okay. Well, each plane is supposed to have a winch <laughs> attached to the bulkhead. Mm -hmm. And you unpin it, and you pin it in this place. And you put a cable down, put a slit, crank it up. You put the shackle on it first. And you crank it up there and after everything's in place then you put the fuses in. Fuses are delicate. Mm -hmm. And then we got to the point where toward 
the end, we did three men to load two planes. We load a, a trailer, two trailers would come out loaded with the mission for the night, whatever it happened to be. Drop one at the first plane, move over to the second plane, and we'd start loading that. When all three guys put their muscle behind it and got that thing in there, two guys walked over to the other plane, which was usually adjacent to Hardstead, 100 yards or so, and they would start loading that. One stayed behind, usually me, the smaller guy, put all the fuses in the bombs, get everything okay, lock up the plane and walk over and help them. By that time, they got the load in and with all three of us putting the fuses in. So we are like a teamwork. And 30 men were usually, if there were 18 to 20 men on duty, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. Because there were furloughs and passes, and there was a KP and guard duty at sick bay, and all the other reasons why a man could not be out that night. Mm -hmm. Or if he was on a pass to town, that meant when he got back at midnight, he was on takeoff standby in the morning. If takeoff was 4, a mor four in the morning, that's your you, your job. If it's 8 o'clock, you get a little extra shut-eye. But take off, there's always somebody, three or four guys are needed out there because somebody will forget something. And you run out to the plane and you yell at what do they want. They, they want another box of fuses, you got them on the truck and you run on and you stick them up under the belly and you get out of the way. And this is all when the planes are doing the elephant dance, come up to the end of the runway. You know, they, they taxi up like, mm -hmm. and they, one takes off, then another. It's a beautiful precision thing. A plane gets off every 30 seconds. 40 planes get off in 20 minutes. 40 planes are recovered half an hour in uh, 20 minutes. The form from formations were precise. Not in the beginning. Mm -hmm. but, and then as men came in uh, from overseas replacements, uh, they were sucked right in. And it was a beautiful system. The commander-in-chief, of course, was Jimmy Doolittle. Prior to that was General Spatz. My commander was uh, Jacob Bro Broder, Broger. He remained a military man until retirement. My captain, my first lieutenant when I met him was squadron commander. His name was Solomon Kutcher. And he looked just like Abe Lincoln without the beard. He finished his tour, retired as a colonel, and he went to medical school. And then he flew his plane, private plane, all over the Amazon, bringing medicine to the Amazon basin. Mm -hmm. and, he, and I have his own bed. Did so you ever have any personal contact with Jimmy uh, Stewart? Once he kicked me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> My wife wanted me to go on. I've got a secret with that. Jimmy Stewart kicked me in the head. But how did that happen? Well. It was a transient aircraft. When it, we were the closest full, full runway to the coast, about 11 miles in. So when they were coming in uh, with little uh, fuel shortage, uh, weather problem, planes would look for the first place to set down. And uh, I'm very emotional, you know, so I, I tear a lot. I cry at opera too. I cry at baby showers. Uh, this plane came in, and our job as standby is to go out and see if they need anything that we're, we're conversant with. And uh, the, the crew got out of the plane. Thank you. I hope this doesn't show. <laughs> and my kids know I cry a lot. Got 18 grandchildren. But uh, anyway. I get to the plane, and I go to duck in, and they're all out, and the guys are crowding around. And I go, get underneath, and a foot comes down, from, backing down from the cockpit onto the catwalk. And they still got some bombs in there. So I have to, so I, wait a minute, I grab this foot, and I put it on a purchase, and I get out of it, go ahead. He give me a shot in the head, you know, not <laughs> much. So when I went outside the plane, I make sure all the fuses have safeties in them. Sometimes they can't put the cotter pins back in mm -hmm. uh, if they've taken them out. It's not that simple. And it's supposed to save all the cotter pins and count them and make sure there's not one without. So anyway, when I got outside, they say, hey, look at that guy over there. Look at that. That's Jimmy Stewart. I said, oh, really? He just kicked me in the head. <laughs> and that was my, my uh, brush.
Mephoresh with fame. He was a, a highly regarded commander. Mm -hmm. I went for a job years later. I, I'm an industrial model maker. I made my living doing engineering, prototype, design, scale models of all kinds for 50 years. I wanted to get a job at a place called Topper Toys in Elizabeth right after they opened the Verrazano Bridge and made it possible to get from Flatbush over. And I passed the muster with the foreman and he said, well, go and see the vice president. I walked into his room and I said, hey, 445th bomb group, big sepia tone on a wall about six feet wide, and it's this B-24, when it's got the uh, letter on the tail. The early planes had a white disc with an identifying, uh, we were H. Uh, I guess they were 445th, I, I can't remember, but I know what it was right away. A, B, A was 44, B was the 93rd, C was the 389, so on. So uh, 14 of them. But they were, uh, changed all that to bright colored tails so they could be seen at a distance. And uh, he said, how do you know that? I said, I was in the 446, I was a bungee. He said, oh, well, sit down and talk. So what'd you do? So he's talking to this guy. He's the vice president of Top of Toys. Top of Toys is $63 million business back then. It's amazing, amazing what toys bring. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we're talking to him an hour, his name is Felix Gilbert. And he said, uh, why, why are you here to see me? I said, I'm coming to look for a job for a model maker. Freddie sent me in here. He says, are you any good? I says, yeah. How much you want? So I jacked it up about a quarter an hour. <laughs> and he says, you're hired. No, I don't test or anything, just like that. And when he came into the shop, he came home. He was lead navigator. He told me he flew lead navigator a couple of times with Jimmy Stewart. And uh, when he rotated home after his tour, he got into pilot training. And he was at, as far as... Uh, P he was looking for P-47 fighters to go on to the Pacific. But uh, the war ended, and he never got that far, but he stayed, he kept his hand in the flying. So he came to the window, and he looked, we on the approach over Elizabeth to uh, Newark. So what does it look like? Uh, about 3,000 foot, nice clouds. Want to go? Yeah, that was the kill, see. You want to go? Yeah. Okay, get to. I go, who wants that brown bag in the sky? For lunch. And it was five bucks a pop, 20 bucks an hour for a little musketeer. He called up uh, the Linden Airport. We'd get in his convertible and drive like a maniac down the highway. You'd get in the plane and go around and fly over New York and uh, have a lot of fun. And he let me handle the wheel. And, uh, you know, you, fly, you can't fly over New York like that now. No. But, uh, I had this one guy in the back, and I said, I put the plane down. I said, you see, Jimmy, that's the, Jimmy Mosca, are you watching? You see, that's the Port Authority bus terminal with the cars on the roof. And then no answer. I looked at him. He said, Freddie, will you stop this? Stop this. He was like petrified. <laughs> Big, tough guy. So I says, oh, yeah. So I turned, I said, see, that? there's the Empire, the Chrysler building. I can put that needle right up your tush. And he said, will you cut it out? Will you cut it out? Felix says, you're getting nervous, cut it out. But uh, it was a wonderful way to spend and a, a half hour lunch. It took an hour and a half and we went to Boston. So what the hell? Life is good. Mm -hmm. I still have pictures. I have a camera in my hand all the time. Took pictures of Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. We got over Brooklyn and uh, looked down on Green over the between Coney Island and uh, Sandy Hook. Hey, there comes the Queen, Queen uh, Elizabeth. And this is in the 60s, it was still peacetime colors, right? It was all back to peacetime. How do you know that? I said, I know all the ships, Jimmy. It's eight miles away. I don't know. I said, Felix, let's go down there. So we went down and went down low, and then she's coming up toward the Verrazano Bridge. And we went down across the bow and right down about lifeboat level. It said right on there, Queen Elizabeth. And we circled around the back and it said, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Liverpool or Southampton. 
and there was the Verrazano Bridge right in front of it. And I ran, I didn't have any film left. One of the best shots I've missed my whole life. So I said, don't argue with me with ships anymore. But going over on the Queen Mary was a real kick. And I'll tell you, the Atlantic Ocean in October, with a ship with no escort, going flat out, is a hell of a thing. It's a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. They assigned us. We got on board the ship at noontime on Monday from Camp Shanks. And we didn't leave till Wednesday, but being we got cabins on a deck, which was for two people. They gave us, we, there were 12 of us in there, three on each bulkhead. And uh, that meant you get a cabin on a deck, you got to do something. So we assigned you as auxiliary gunners. The Army Transportation Corps had small ball gunners on board for 40 millimeters and 20 millimeters. The British Navy had guys for three inch and five inch big guns. And they need guys to teach each trip how to teach pass ammunition in case of an emergency. So that's what I got. And you stand watches. I think it's two hours on, two, four off, whatever it is. It's constantly changing. So I was out there, outdoors, hanging over the side of the ship, watching the fluorescence, uh, phosphorescence in the middle of the night. It's amazing. And all we're supposed to be watching for submarine periscopes. And the ship don't watch don't watch the mass because it rocks and you watch the stars and you get seasick. So don't do that. She rolls. You know. She's unbelievable. There was a general quarters one day. By the time I got up, I said, what's it, what's it all about? What's it about? They said, look over there. And the two ships came up at the same time, and there was a brief flash of a ship that looked like white in the sunlight. It disappeared. Never saw it again. But it was about five miles away. So it was enough for a, an emergency. And when I climbed up on top of the big ventilators, where they had 20 millimeters, to be with one of my squadron buddies, I looked down at the bridge. And every six feet across that bridge, on the exposed part, there was a British sailor. Did not take his eyes off the horizon. And they were not allowed to have conversations and get distracted. And those guys were looking out to protect that ship. And they were disciplined, man. It just... They were up there for hours just looking. Did you ever uh, keep in contact with anyone that you served with? Yes, I, my, my very good friend, his name Alex Knoll in Waterbury. He was the, the chaplain's assistant. He was a father figure to me. Uh, he kept me from uh, getting too interested in women. And kept me going to church when he could when he could twist my arm. But he was Catholic too. He was Chaplain Gannon, uh, is our Protestant chaplain. He just died at 100 this year. Wow. And uh, the other chaplain was Catholic. Alex took care of the mass, did everything. And uh, <clears throat> I call him now and again. His wife was a nurse in the, with the army in the Philippines. And he was a sergeant. She was a lieutenant. So she says, when you, when you see Julie again, you have to salute her before you kiss her. <laughs> it's all, it's all, that, that kind of, all good natured stuff. Mm -hmm. and men appreciate it. And they married. And she now has Alzheimer's. And she's failing. And I give him a call every couple of months. And it's, it's such a good man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a job with the uh, one of the big brass companies in, I think, in Waterbury as, a, as some level of administration. Good guy. I'm one of the guys who chose a trade. But I'm not sorry either. Okay. okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I didn't tell you about the girls yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just basically... I got home, I got a wife. Mm -hmm. She was my mother's nurse. It was my 22nd birthday that week. And she said to me, uh, it's your birthday, would you like to go to a party with me? And I said, sure. My mother gave her a good build up. A nice girl, Fred, pay attention. Uh, her name was Pat Blake. And uh, 
I said, we're going to party? Anybody I know there? She says, I don't know. I said, people you know? She said, yeah. Your boyfriend going to be there? Would she give me a look? And she looked at my mother like, oh boy. <laughs> she said, I said, my mother told me you just got dumped. I said, you're going to take me to the party as a trophy. I'm not going. <laughs> so we went and rode the Staten Island Ferry all night. We smooched. And that was in August. We got married in October. <laughs> and, and that was two years later my first son was born. So there was no born in the oven or anything uh -huh. like that. She gave me eight kids in ten years. My kids are five boys and two girls. My oldest son is 55, and he's taking care of me now with a regimen of uh, nourishment and vitamins and uh, various uh, homeopathic things. Mm -hmm. He's a guru for that stuff. And since he studied it all his life, I'm not going to challenge him. Mm -hmm. But he is doing everything he can, and I, I said that, you know, He's a, he's a foreman of air conditioning on a high rise. And he's, he's never been out of work in the union for 35 years. The union has many times been just sitting around. But he's a pusher. I told all my sons, you do your work, you do it honestly with pride, and you look to pay master in the eye. You don't go hide out in a can and read a paper. And that boss will remember when everybody gets laid off, mm -hmm. you won't be laid off. And in our business, display business, trade show displays, that everything drops dead at Thanksgiving and doesn't start until Valentine's Day, so you're home for the Christmas. But uh, if you want to, all the, all the kissing up to this, the shops do it, will do you any good. If a 40 man shop drops down to five, you're only one of the five because you're good. And I got that to my sons, and they all, they all kept that up. My son never lost, worked up for an apprentice boy in the World Trade Center. Uh, to uh, high rise on uh, skyscrapers and uh, makes a very good salary. He's got a very good equity in the union. He's got three three girls out of college and uh, two grandsons. And he's a he's a good man. I said, "You must. I'm glad. I'm glad you're a rich kid." And he said, "Well, Dad, and I I, I appreciate this, Rick. If I." didn't try and you died, I would not forgive myself. Mm -hmm. If I try and you die, to yes. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my son. And they're, they're all five of them are like that. Two of them have gone already. Peter died for uh, inoperable tumor two years ago, the five kids. And uh, it's just, life is very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, all you have to do is hope for the future. I have nothing but chagrin and trepidation about our future. Uh, I don't know why anybody who is, if this is politically incorrect, I don't care. Anyone who had a military career have to refer to that guy uh, as commander in chief. What are his qualifications? It's, a, it's just a an ordinary uh, The chief, the president gets his word. That's a bad system. That man doesn't know the first damn thing about going out and reading the Sunday Times and looking for a job on Monday morning. He doesn't know the first thing about putting enough money on the table to feed ten kids at family of ten. He doesn't know the first thing about going to a, uh, an agency and getting through a few people before you get to talk to a guy someplace else in town who might hire you. He doesn't know how to, to deal with European-born craftsman right after the war who would give a guy with hands, an American boy of hands, a, a fair shake. We couldn't do anything. I have worked in ten museums around the world and two pieces in the Smithsonian that done off my bench with my back and my hands. That's the way I fed my kids and I have nothing to, to make excuses for. The management menuet is not on my program and, uh, and that's the thing I am proudest of all, and I guess my kids are pretty sick of hearing it, <laughs> but that's, that's my final state. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.